So welcome to everyone um, for joining us here today on this first day of spring. It's beautiful, yeah. <laughs> It was a long time coming, right? <laughs> so beautiful sunny day for this event. My name's Candace Keys. I'm an advisor with the Green Wealth Advisory Team. So most of you in the room know me quite well, and if you don't know me, you definitely know at least one of the members of our team. Um, so I thought I would take a few minutes to introduce you to our team in a fun way. So our team was brought together intentionally to embrace different personality traits as well as unique skills and talents, which ultimately brings value to our clients. So I'm going to introduce each member of the team, so maybe give a wave in case someone in the room doesn't know you. So Kelsey Carpenter is a marketing associate on the team, way in the back corner there. So Kelsey's top three personality traits are woo, communication, and relator. So Kelsey orchestrated this event, planned everything around it, which really speaks to those personality traits she has. Next is Carissa Beatty, a client associate, right in the middle. So Carissa has harmony, empathy, and consistency. And as the first point of contact for the team, you can see how important these traits are. So next is me. Uh, I have relator, responsibility, and competition. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> competition, which says it all with my finger injury. So, you know, if you know me at all, you won't be surprised uh, by this as I take great, great pride in process and what we do for our clients. And I like to win, which is the competitive part in this whole injury. So that leads me to John Green. So John has strategic, ideation, and futuristic. So really, that says it all, especially with respect to the content of the luncheon today. So John is continually looking forward with an open mind in terms of the future and how we as a team can be on the leading edge of the industry and how we can evolve our client experience. So to summarize, it's really about connecting with people powered by process. So I also, speaking of process, want to make mention of a couple other TD partners in the room. So I'll maybe just get you guys to give a little wave. Um, and these partners really come in when, you know, we talk about the four pillars that TD has to offer. So, you know, we're often referred to as investment advisors or brokers, but it's really about much more than that and these pillars and how we bring in our partners. So Tyler Parcoma with private banking, right in the middle there. Jan King with private trust towards the back. Stephen Haynes, uh, rather than saying his title, essentially he's our liaison with our retail partners and our private wealth management division. Doug Dornan, estate planning advisor, aka insurance. And Tanis Dawson up at the front. Uh, she's our in-house CPA and is a planner when it comes to complexities um, with our high net worth clients. So without further ado, I would like to introduce John Green to get the luncheon rolling. So thank you for being here today for a, a look into the future and what, what things await us. <clears throat> if you think things are changing, you're already too late. You can't jump on a moving train. You have to be on it and wait for it to get up to speed. So the opportunity to discuss the digital age is around us constantly and can at times be overwhelming. Jerome Bruner is a well-known educator and a future thinker, a forward thinker. And to paraphrase one of his quotes, he explains that every solution to a problem creates another problem. That seems to be happening with great speeds these days. And the digital age is affecting all industries, none more than banking, finance, and investments. And just to put that into perspective for you, uh, inside of TD, the number of people who go into bank branches today is down by 50% in five years, and they expect that to drop by another third over the next three years. So how we do banking and how we interact 
is really changing right before us. And uh, with CNN and BNN and CNBC constantly in our ears uh, and in front of us all the time, our team's job is really to help identify what will serve your life. So think of us as your noise-canceling headphones that you might wear on the, on the airplane. And if information and knowledge are the science, relationship and behavior is the art. Data and the speed at which it arrives will never replace human interaction, and that connection is more important than ever. Interesting, when we buy things today, we're shown features of the product. So your 3D TV, the features in your new car, the latest iPhone, and what makes these technologies new, innovative, and better than its predecessor. The real question should be, do we ever take the time to reflect on what we actually need? It is the fact that my new iPhone can shoot depth of field photos, or is it really about that moment with the grandson or the family or on a vacation or with your friends and so on? So by a show of hands, who has recently bought one of these phones or a car or a smart thermostat or a tablet? Anybody? Done one of those lately? Okay. So has anyone actually gone to the trouble of going online and understanding all of the features and how they work? Yeah, not one hand. So everybody's bought the latest equipment. We just don't know how to use it, but we are very familiar with the features because that was explained to us when we bought the darn thing. So, so um, Odds are you're actually not using anywhere near what is avail available to you, and it begs the question, how is it actually serving your life? So speaking of relationships, now is a good time for me to thank the team that I have a privilege of working alongside. So Candace, as you've heard, has been, uh, uh, is now a partner in the business, and we've been working together on our team since 2005. Kelsey has been... Uh, um, uh, with TD Well since 2011, and as you heard again, um, is our genius and our tech guru. I want to stop for a moment there and, and, and uh, tell you a little story. So one of the things that I appreciate about what everyone else brings really doesn't necessarily mean how much they know or uh, what education they've had, but it's really in the, in the smaller things. And we had an experience a couple of weeks ago where um, one of our clients had this new phone and hadn't been able to receive emails from her friends for the last 11 months because she didn't know how to change the setting for her to get them or to reply in, in some way, shape, or form. So Kelsey just picked it up and said, well, I can, I can look after that for you. And about 34 seconds later, all of these emails start, uh, start streaming in. And, and I can tell you, for that person, that was an incredibly valuable experience for her. And really, it's about the little things when it comes right down to it. Um, Carissa just has had her 10th anniversary with our office. And as you've heard, brings a personal touch to clients. Um, and one of the other pieces I'd like to share is if you are in part of our morning meetings, uh, there's always this great laugh that comes about every 40 seconds, and that is owned by uh, our friend Carissa Beatty, and it's infectious, and it actually shows. It brings the team together, and it's another one of those intangibles one can't count on, but you really appreciate when you have it. So that's lots of experience. I confess to the fact that I bring up the average age on this team. <laughs> Um, and uh, I intend to keep working for as long as uh, I'm able, so that's a long time, just team members, that's just so you know that. Um, but we are blessed to have uh, people with us in the room today that are here to help get our heads around what's coming and what might improve our lives. I heard uh, Raj Lala speak last year in Montreal and thought his team would be a great fit for our event. They're a firm, Evolve. ETFs that have made great strides in bringing technology and innovative, specific investments for us all to understand and use. 
uh, in our portfolios. Robert Udima is a technology professor from Ryerson University in Toronto and brings a wealth of technology knowledge to, dis sorry, to, dis to today's discussions. Uh, so when we're done lunch, I'm going to have these gentlemen come up and we'll sort of do a, a little fireside chat here. So enjoy the rest of the lunch and we'll talk to you in a few moments. Thanks. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to give you a really quick introduction to uh, the firm that I run called Evolve ETFs. We launched our business uh, about a year and a half ago. We launched 12 ETFs over the course of the last year and a half. We really separated our business into two primary categories. One focused in on actively managed ETFs where we view certain asset classes to be beneficial from active management. Maybe not necessarily for large cap Canadian equities or US large cap equities, but definitely in areas such as the fixed income market uh, and also things like preferred shares, small to mid cap equities where a good portfolio manager can make a significant difference uh, from a, a risk-adjusted return perspective. So we've partnered up with some of the largest uh, portfolio managers uh, in Canada as well as the world. Uh, we launched a couple of funds with, uh, with Foyce and Gordon Payne, who are a local manager based out of Toronto. Uh, they run about $13 billion and they're running a preferred share fund as well as a core Canadian fixed income fund for us. Uh, we also partnered up with Nuveen, which is uh, part of an organization in the U.S. called TIAA, which is effectively the U.S.'s version of Ontario Teachers, uh, to run a U.S. large cap fund as well as a, a short duration high yield bond fund. And then most recently, we partnered up with a firm called Alliance, which is one of the world's largest portfolio management companies, uh, also the world's largest insurance company. Uh, and also the sister company to PIMCO, if any of you are familiar with uh, the fixed income world, to run a actively managed global bond fund for us. The other side to our business, which kind of surrounds a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, is really around thematic index-based ETFs, surrounding topics that have a long-term investment thesis, surrounding topics that people like John can sit across the table from a client and actually have a conversation about, uh, so we launched Canada's first cybersecurity ETF, we launched Canada's first gender diversity ETF, we launched uh, one of the first blockchain ETFs, we also launched uh, the world's first innovation ETF, and uh, the world's first future of the automobile ETF. So lots of firsts, a lot of the topics that we're going to be covering off today uh, are, are central to the themes of those funds. Our performance has been extremely strong. Our cybersecurity ETF actually ended up being the top performing ETF in Canada uh, for 2018. That's out of a universe of over 500 ETFs uh, that are in this space. We have a global healthcare fund that ended up being the number three performing uh, ETF in the country as well. So we've been blessed with really good performance in our first year and a half. We also ended up being the fastest growing ETF provider in Canada. Uh, we, as I said, we've been at it for a year and a half and we're already at 450 million in assets. So we're going to be talking about how the world is changing uh, over the course of the next 10 years, 15, 20 years, and going beyond that uh, as well. And I think it's important to kind of set the tone because we're going to be talking about things like, for example, many of us will actually have robots living in our home in the next 10 years. Many of us will be in self-driving vehicles in the next 5 to 10 years. A number of you will laugh. Uh, and say that that's impossible, that that's never going to happen. But I think it's important to take a look back at history and the developments and the changes that have taken place in our world to be able to accept, hopefully accept, what we're in for over the course of the next 20 years. 115 years ago, the automobile was invented. And the biggest advisor to Henry Ford said, there's not a chance that the automobile is ever going to be uh, successful. People are going to stick to the horse and buggy uh, strategy for transportation. Over the last 40 years, we've gone from 342 million vehicles to over 1.4 billion vehicles that travel and uh, that take us around the world. Next, some of you probably haven't even thought about Blockbuster in a long time. I remember when Netflix first came out, my wife and I were at Blockbuster and she said, I can't imagine ever uh, using a, an app like Netflix to watch movies when you can just go to the video store and actually pick out uh, what, you, what you want to watch and read the back cover, because that's fantastic, because it gives you a great summary. 
of, of, uh, of movies. There was 9,000 blockbuster videos in 2004. Six years later, they filed for bankruptcy. There's actually one left, which I just found out last week is in the midst of getting shut down uh, as well. So Netflix, for example, has become the way that most of us are actually being entertained or watching uh, movies, or in, in today's case, obviously, television shows as well. The internet. 1990, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad, that it was never going to catch on. Today, this is what happens in an internet minute. One million people logging into Facebook. For those of you pretty familiar with social media, you probably know that the number one source of information or news for us today is Facebook. For individuals aged 35 to 50 in North America, it's LinkedIn. It's not the Wall Street Journal. It's not CNN. It's social media. And social media has, has made such a massive impact uh, in our world today. I love this one. Steve Ballmer, some of you remember him. He was the CEO of Microsoft. When the iPhone came out, he said, there's not a chance that anybody is ever going to use a smartphone or an iPhone. They're, they're not going to get any uh, market share. Today, more than a billion iPhones have been sold by Apple. It has become not our way of communicating, but our way of surfing the net uh, and, and dealing with every social media uh, application that we could possibly use, and then also using things like Google Assistant and so many other things within our phone. It's amazing how we're so hugged and tied uh, to that technology. Back to the old picture. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so now I think uh, Bob and I are going to talk about a uh, bunch of different topics around technology. So thanks for that introduction, Raj. And I'm hoping today's... Uh, discussion really is interactive, so if there's some burning question you feel you have to ask, put your hand up and, and uh, we'll look after it. If you have things, again, that you would like to write down and we can get to later, we'll do that as well. So why don't I start things off uh, by something that uh, is on the news on an ongoing basis that we hear about all the time that I think everyone in this room can relate to, and it, it is around the topic of cybersecurity. In fact, it's the number one topic uh, that people worry about the most. So, um, Raj, sure, why don't you start. start that off? So how many of you actually remember uh, the blue screen of death? Everybody had it. May, may not be able to remember it. It was our first encounter with cybercrime. But there was no economic model to it. Uh, a hacker would plant a virus into your computer or a worm or a horse, Trojan horse, uh, into your computer and it would lock up your hard drive and it would force you to either throw away your computer or get your hard drive rebuilt. Today, cyber criminals are much, much smarter. Um, we have things like the Petya virus, ransomware in general, where people will hijack your data and they'll hold it hostage. And they'll say to you, give us X thousand or X million in many corporate cases uh, and uh, we'll give you back your data. The interesting part about it is that 99.9% .9 of the time, if you pay the ransom, you actually get your data back because cyber criminals know it would be a really bad business model to get a reputation for not giving that data back. But at that point, every organization, if it's an organization that's been hacked, needs to figure out what the role is of a cybersecurity company that they're going to be dealing with. So it's almost like, it's like a house. I think it's probably one of the best analogies of cybersecurity. You know, you live in a home, you have an alarm system, the alar and then you put stickers of that alarm system, let's say it's ADT, up on all your windows, and it's supposed to serve as a deterrent um, for, for somebody to enter into your home or break into that house. So that's what cybersecurity firms do. They help serve as a deterrent for a number of these companies. If somebody breaks into your home, then they trip your alarm. That's the exact same thing that a cybersecurity firm has to do for organizations, is make sure that you're aware very quickly that somebody has breached into your system. And then let's say they breach and then they steal the data, or in the house's case, they steal a bunch of things from your home. You have to call the police, you have to call the insurance company, you've got to do an entire forensic analysis, and then you have to figure out what you're going to do to prevent this from happening again. Maybe you go and buy a dog to protect your house. Um, with cybersecurity, it's going to be all of those points to help protect an organization. What is most interesting about cybersecurity at, from an investment perspective is that it's one of the very few areas that has a non-discretionary spend 
attached to it, meaning that cybercrime is going to continue to increase. Right now, it's costing the global economy three, four trillion dollars. It's expected over the next five years, it's going to cost six trillion. And that's an important number to kind of put into perspective. That's larger than the GDP of countries like Germany uh, and Japan. So it's going to cost the global economy uh, a lot over the course of the next little while. So companies have to increasingly spend more money to make sure that they're protected. So think about it from a bank perspective. If CIBC or TD has a really terrible <laughs> quarter of financial results, you're never going to hear Bharat from TD, who, who's the CEO of TD Bank, you're never going to hear him stand up in front of shareholders and say that we've decided to decrease our spending budget on cybersecurity. Uh, it's a complete non-discretionary spend. They have to continue to increase that. They might say, we're going to reduce headcount, we're going to close branches, we're going to defer this initiative or that initiative, but they have to continuously increase their spending on it. And there was a great example, some of you may remember, about a year and a half ago, Equifax uh, got breached, made a lot of news. There was 143 million records that got breached. It was not just your name and address, but your so social insurance number in the US's cases. Uh, social security number, your date of birth, all your debt outstanding. The moment that that ma got made public, Equifax stock <coughs> dropped 35%. That is every CEO's worst nightmare of any financial services organization. So it's one of those areas where they have to continuously stay ahead of cybercrime. And one last point I would make <coughs> on that, which is I think a, a really important point on cybercrime. Um, there are between three to five million attempted breaches per day at the banks, our Canadian banks, per day. Most of the, uh, most of the banks will have about 20 to 50 people specializing in cybersecurity. So that tells you that there's not a chance that they could comb through all of it which is why 80% of all the work of cybersecurity work is actually performed by external organizations. Like a lot of the organizations in our ETF, for example, are working with all the Fortune 500 companies or the governments or Interpol and, and, and the agencies uh, worldwide. So there's such a massive amount of attempted breaches out there right now. And also there's, and, and, and Bob's, Bob's better at this part because there's also a massive shortage of human capital as it relates to um, cybersecurity. If any of you are trying to figure out a career for your kid or grandchild, tell them to get into cybersecurity because there are millions of uh, shortages. In fact, it's probably one as of the only- As a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> as a good guy. <laughs> as a good guy. <laughs> bad guys make a lot of money, unfortunately, too. Uh, there's a massive shortage, uh, and it's one of the few industries that actually has negative unemployment right now. We, we, we live in a different world. Uh, if you turn the clock back 100 years, uh, uh, people robbed banks with machine guns. And I'm thinking Bonnie and Clyde. And there was a Hollywood movie done in 1967. Well, you know something? Uh, people still rob banks, but they rob them with a computer. Uh, and that's the, 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 the new normal. Uh, everybody in this room is a potential target for uh, uh, computer crime of one uh, shape, form, or another. We were talking earlier this morning that uh, most of us in the room have got a call that uh, there's a warrant for your arrest. It's from CRA, and if you don't cough up, uh, uh, how many people got that phone call from the, the okay, um, and, and uh, How many the, people uh, called back? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that, that's something called social engineering. So you as individuals are targets for, for this as well too, uh, as well as uh, all the large companies. And we've seen some uh, absolutely uh, mammoth uh, breaches in, in, in identity. Uh, if you have stayed at a married hotel in the last 10 years, the, uh, your uh, personal information, passport numbers, uh, travel plans, uh, travel preferences, everything is, uh, is in somebody else's hands. Uh, and the forensics to date um, we build, the interesting thing is there was no financial loss to married hotels. Usually people break in to an organization to get uh, revenue and cash. Like, that's what the banks have. They got cash. In this case, the, uh, the tools used uh, are Chinese.
Chinese tools, and we believe that that's uh, essentially spying activities uh, from, a, from a sponsored state. Um, I know that uh, everybody in this room, if you've got a bank account, I assume that if you're TD, friends with TD, uh, if you uh, get uh, loans from the bank uh, in that 10-page loan agreement, uh, there will be a clause saying that the banks can share your information with other banks and credit agencies and wh whatnot, and that means that uh, uh, all the banks will share your information with credit agencies, and the big one is Equifax, and literally 300 million people's private banking information. If you have that private banking information, you can pretend you're me, and you can go and, and do everything I can do, and you can empty my bank accounts and, and, and a whole lot more, so it's that scary. Uh, I did a talk with these guys a few weeks ago, and, and uh, they told me, how, do you, how can you protect yourselves? And uh, they asked me to come up with three uh, ways. I came up with four. I'm, I'm sure I can remember them. Number one, and this is something I do. Uh, number one, uh, you got to be vigilant. You got to keep your eyes and ears open. And in my case, I pay, I pay my bills online twice a month. So I look at, I know how much I've got in all my accounts. I make sure that that number is there. I make sure that uh, anything that's going in my bank account and going out of my <coughs> bank account uh, seems right. I do the same with, with my visa, which I pay on a monthly basis. Uh, and uh, so, and if something looks uh, Wrong. I'm I'm literally split down to understand what happened, and I, and I'm on top of it. Uh, uh, the banks try their best, but if somebody uh, takes my identity and starts uh, uh, doing financial transactions, uh, I need to be on top of it. Sooner you find out about it, you're you're better. Uh, passwords. Uh, if you have the opportunity of setting up something called two-factor authentication with uh, your providers, that's a big plus. Two-factor authentication has been used by the banks for for the 30 or for 30 or more years with uh, um, your debit card or your credit card. If you want to use a money machine, uh, you have to you have to have something. That's the card. And then you and when you put the card in the machine, you have to know something, uh, which is your your PIN number. So if you've got passwords on any accounts, the, particularly the ones that are. Uh, contain private or sensitive information, uh, two-factor authentication will protect you because the bad guys won't have that second uh, uh, piece of authentication. So they can they can harvest your password, but they can still cause no harm. So that, that's something very good. Now, I have a good friend of mine, Rosemary. She just got uh, emails um, from uh, somebody using a server in Japan saying, we've got your address book, and if you don't cough up money, we're going to send porn to everybody in your address book. And she just freaked out. Um, and uh, uh, and and I said, and it turns out the threats appeared to be empty. Um, but uh, she was in a panic mode, and uh, we we told her to send an email out to all everybody in her address book to make sure that that if you've got email attachments, don't open them. A lot of viruses and malware come in from email attachments, and if I got an email <laughs> attachment from Rosemary, I'd likely open it. Um, if you get uh, so, never open an email attachment that comes by email unless you're expecting it from a trusted inf in individual. Uh, and if you're not sure, just go out to the cloud and use something like Google Docs. Google Docs is uh, is, is uh, the right place to open up stuff that uh, you're you're not sure of. So that's a, a safe way, and that won't that'll prevent viruses from coming in your system. And in the event that something bad happens, and and, and things can happen bad, we can have theft. Oh, somebody could steal your computer. Uh, you, 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 your computer hard drive may seize up and fry, or you may get hacked. Uh, in which case, what you want to do is have a, something that, that you can have a backup. And, and I'm not a big guy in backups. However, I use two computers, one at work and one at home, and I got a USB key. So if one of those machines is, is uh, totally disappears out of my life, uh, you'll probably hear a lot of four-letter words from me, but I'll be up and running in 24 hours because uh, the difference between the two machines is on my USB key. How many people here, if you lost your machine today, you'd be up and running tomorrow? OK, not many. OK, think about it. Um, I would add a couple more things uh, to Boy, he's, he's, you're, he's scared, the, you're scaring the, me, so no, no, no. I'm pretty sure you're scaring most of the people yeah, no, in the room here. So this is, the, is there this anything is, positive we could come yeah, out of this? Uh, Not on the security <laughs> side. Nothing? No, no, wait, wait, wait. I just want to <laughs> two, two put, put two your more, money under the bed, right? Two more, <laughs> two more, uh, two more points. Okay. Um, number one, don't ever click on that link that you get from a bank that you don't deal with. We all have gotten them. You, let's say you deal with TD, but you get one from Scotia. Uh, don't, don't be tempted uh, to click on it. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as an organization that exists that doesn't have one employee that will click on that link, and that ends up being the entry point for hackers. Right. Number two, don't, try to stay away from uh, public Wi-Fi, um, like especially Starbucks, for example. 
uh, because that's where hackers go and set up and they might, might not be Starbucks, it might be Starbucks One, you might not know the difference, you click on that and you now have given, uh, you've given exposure uh, of your device to uh, all those people. So that's the, that's the only other, and don't call CRA back. <laughs> okay, on that rousing start, <laughs> Why don't we? This is the only negative topic okay, that we're. There we go. That we're that um, but it's a growth, today. good growth. If but you got sons important. and daughters, okay, there's, there's, you, you, your, your Career. sons and daughters will have a six-figure income for the rest of their lives. Okay, so this well, is actually, sorry, one, one, one point on that because I think that's really important. So a friend of mine, a, a fr okay, a friend of mine uh, runs a company uh, in Canada uh, called FireEye, which is actually the company that got contracted to clean up Equifax. There was such a massive shortage of human capital that he decided to set up a 40,000 square foot learning facility downtown Toronto to uh, educate people, provide them with a free education, a two-year uh, education on cybersecurity on the condition that they have to stay and work at FireEye for three years. And if they left... Uh, within that three-year period, then they'd have to pay a pro rata uh, amount of the value of that education back to the organization. It just shows you how much of a shortage of human capital that whole space has. Anyways, that's... No, it's good. Um, that's a positive, right? It, it, yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, there's one question that's come up already, and it says, am I more at risk for cyber attack while I'm logged on to my bank or investor account, or does it not matter? Uh, if you, the important thing is, if you log into your uh, an investor account, uh, you're going to typically supply your uh, the information on your debit card, right. okay, as well as a, a hopefully a lengthy password, and those should not be stored in your computer cache. Uh, so don't, if it, you know a lot of these browsers are friendly, uh, it says, "Do you want to save the password?" Uh, and it's in there uh, if somebody else gets access to your machine. So please clear that cache out, uh, and it will go through uh, what's called public key cryptography. And you'll see on the, in, 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 when you've got the URL of the uh, web page, it'll go HTTP and it'll change to HTTPS, and that's a secure HTTP. So that says the data going back and forth is encrypted and, and it's safe. And and if it goes HTTPS. And it also says tdbank.ca, which is the name of, of the, the URL. You actually are talking to the bank. So what if I, like, you save your passwords and they're, like, fingerprint protected? Is that, is that, a uh, is that your second? Uh, I know with uh, federal government laptops, they have two-factor authentication. All the laptops, if you're with the federal government, you'd have to use your fingerprint and scan it to also get access. Right. So, so that's two-factor authentication. And that, that's, that's a big plus. And so if, you, if somebody steals that laptop from your car, they won't be able to use it unless they've got the fingerprints. The other thing that you could do, I was going to say, is you could live like Bob and be off-grid. Uh, Bob carries around a burner phone. And I have cash. Different and phones at different variety <laughs> stores. He carries cash. Lives off the grid. Don't try to look not, them up not, online. Not, not too you much cash, okay? Bur burner phone, there's no GPS, okay? Uh, and and uh, you, you can get one at a 7-Eleven store. You can pay with cash. You know, it's no names associated with it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, this is real. It, this it, is it's real. run this by is, Rogers, so I'm the, uh, on Rogers, 25 cents a minute. And and the cool thing is that if you give them 100 bucks, uh, they'll give you an extra $25 minute, minutes, and the phone, it's 10 bucks. So if I lose the phone, there's, there's essentially no loss. So, but but I don't have GPS. I don't have all the apps on it. And, and for the rest and, of and, us, and and I got that all at the office. So, that yeah. it, it. <laughs> okay, enough of that. <laughs> Let's go down to something that's a little more interesting. And and uh, I think for a lot of us, the second most popular question that comes up is, <clears throat> what's happening with cars and automobiles and how that relates to. Uh, um, uh, Uber and Lyft and some of the ride-sharing programs, because just in the last couple of months, we actually have a ride-sharing service oh, here in, in Saskatoon and in Regina, and that's, that's going to be a game-changer. So tell us a little bit more about the future of cars and autonomous vehicles and so on. So I think that I have two 11-year-old daughters, obviously twins. Uh, I, I think that there's a, a very high probability that they will not need to drive. Uh, by the time they get to that 16, 17. So I'm a believer that in the next five years, we ha will have autonomous cars. Uh, the wild card in there will be uh, legislation, but the technology uh, will uh, be there. So the technology needs, to, there's, there's, there, in autonomous cars, there's this thing called levels. So level one would basically be us driving our old Pontiac, and then level five would be full autonomous uh, cars that can drive on their own. And we're probably right now at about 3.5. So we're 
Uh, we're at the stage where the technology is still not strong enough uh, to get there, but it's, it's, it's approaching level four, which is where um, you can have autonomous cars in certain situations, but not every situation. Um, you know, we were talking before about, about weather, for example, still hasn't been solved for starting to approach being able to identify cyclists and what their, what their move's going to be using LiDAR. But it is definitely coming. Um, we, I believe that uh, many of us will have our first uh, autonomous driving experience this year because we will be in a car in Ontario. Obviously, we have Uber and we have Lyft. Uh, we will be in a car that will have a technician sitting at the wheel, but the, the car will be driving itself. He or she will just be there to intercept if something goes wrong. And I think that this is going to be the biggest change in our world over the course of the next 10 years because of how much time we spend typically in our vehicle. And these changes are already started, have already started to take place. I mean, you know, most of our cars today have uh, blind spot checkers. They have cameras on the front and the back. They have park assist. They have brake assist. These are all levels of autonomous uh, attributes that are going to be going into uh, cars today. So um, I think it's a super interesting time. I also think that you're going to have the growing electrification uh, of the vehicle as well. Uh, you know, it took 10 years for the first million electric vehicles to be sold, uh, and we're approaching another million over the course of the next, like, over the last, sorry, uh, seven, eight months. So I think the electric, the connected, I also think, I know this is a wild idea, uh, but I also think that uh, the millennial um, uh, population, uh, if you go and talk to them and have conversation with 10 of them, I bet you six or seven of them have zero interest in driving. Uh, they want the autonomous cars or they want shared, um, which is also going to become a, a big part. So when you take a look at what's happening in the world, GM, for example, is planning to have every single one of their cars in the next three years either be hybrid or electric. They're also invested into Maven, which is a big auto share uh, program, and they're, they're investing a lot into AI, which is really important for autonomous cars as well. And every car manufacturer is doing that. And then you take a look at countries like India and China, they're in the next 15 years going to be banning the combustible engine uh, as well. So we'll be moving more and more to electric, which means that the infrastructure development uh, in that area will, will, will grow as well. Um, one last point that I, that, that I would make on this, just to talk about that difference between uh, level 3.5 and level 5, meaning level 5 being full autonomous. Just to give you a sense of the fact that technology is still not there. So NVIDIA, if any of your kids or any of you have an Xbox, um, NVIDIA created the technology uh, for, for Xbox. Uh, they also have a drive unit called NVIDIA Drive. They create the semiconductors or the chips that go into self-driving cars. Right now they have a chip that has the ability to make 3.2 million decisions per second. Sounds like a lot, right? But when you're driving, when all of us are driving, we're making about 10 million decisions per second. We just don't know it because it's most of it's, well, almost all of it is unconscious. So they still don't have a chip that has the ability to, to, to get that technology to the point where we have the ability to make 10 million decisions per second, but it's coming over the course of the next four or five years. I'm going to say I got a letter from the government uh, that I now qualify for old age security. Uh, it's the first time that I've got a letter from the government offering me money. Okay. <laughs> it's a mixed blessing. Uh, and the mixed blessing is my eyes aren't as good as they were when I was in my 20s, and my reaction times aren't as good as they were in my 20s. And in the coming years, uh, because of my uh, physical decline, I'm not going to be uh, as good a driver as, a, as it was before. And I welcome the opportunity of autonomous driving. I want to get in the car and said, car, take me to my cottage. And I want to have a snooze on the way there instead of uh, driving up Highway 400 uh, to Georgian Bay. Uh, and it's Alligator Alley because it, it, there's been some significant uh, crashes that in, involve fatalities. Uh, keep your eyes and ears on Elon Musk, OK? I, I think he's a liability of, to himself. He's going to crash and burn. But what he's done in terms of space travel 
vehicle and um, electric vehicles and automation is, is, is truly amazing. So, so put aside uh, the character. I mean, it's a, he, he is truly a genius, but it's flawed, OK? Uh, but the, the company, with or without him, and I think the, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission kicked <laughs> him out of the board of directors and stuff. So he's, he's certainly got some issues. But if you were to take a, a Tesla S and disassemble it, um, it's got some good and bad in it. The bad is they were rushed to the market, uh, and they got lots more parts in there that they needed. Uh, so they got to the market quickly. But their motors are outstanding. Uh, their batteries are at least two to three years ahead of anybody else's battery technology. Uh, Tesla, uh, all the other cars drive on these things called pouches. They're like square rectangular batteries. He took the batteries you find in your computer products cylindrical ones, and uh, they actually have better energy density, and they're cheaper to make. Uh, and he's done some amazing things in the last two years that are that are quiet, and I'll share them with you. Uh, you mentioned NVIDIA. Uh, the other competitor to NVIDIA has been uh, AMD, and they've been making graphics chips. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, back in 2016, got the top designers out of uh, AMD, and uh, they he put them to work and to make a new chip that is an order of magnitude faster faster the in, than the NVIDIA processors. Elon Musk claims that he can do autonomous driving without the laser <coughs> uh, radar, LIDAR, which is bulky and huge and, and, and costly, uh, which is truly amazing. Now, he may be, this may be a hyperbole. I think the technology is there. Certainly, the, the regulation isn't there. Interesting, Elon Musk also quietly last, uh, I think it's November, made a purchase of $210 million, a company called Maxwell Technologies. Uh, not a big company. Uh, they've been in, in business doing government work making these super capacitors which store energy, but most importantly, they have a key patent. Their key patent is to make these lithium batteries with dry um, electrolyte. In other words, they're not wet anymore. Two advantages, 20% more energy density and almost double the battery lifetime, okay? So that puts him at a country mile ahead of everybody else in the battery business, and they're his. Uh, Elon, Elon Musk was talking with ARK Investments a few weeks ago. They asked him, when are we going to have truly autonomous driving? He says, 2020. And, and people's jaws dropped. Uh, uh, but he backpedaled a little bit. He says, subject to regulation. So the technology's there. Uh, but it, it's a question about uh, the governments and, and regulation. So keep an eye on Tesla. They will either go super, and from an investment standpoint, I can't predict their future. But from a techno technology standpoint, they've made all the right moves. Uh, the question is, are they? Are, is, is Elon Musk uh, have the same uh, smarts and marketing vision that Stephen Jobs had, and I think he's the only person that I can I can think of uh, that's alive that has that potential. So I think he's going to be. I, I, Are you going to buy Tesla? Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> I, 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 I think he is going to go down as probably one of the greatest visionaries of our time. Um, I think he's got issues uh, for sure, but most geniuses uh, have uh, issues. Uh, as well, but I, I agree. I agree um, with some of the some of Bob's other comments, and I think one of the important things to take away from this discussion on the automobile is uh, is the amount of increased safety uh, that it's going to create in all of our lives. Uh, for example, today uh, there are 60% fewer uh, traffic fatalities than there were uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and that goes to you know our blind spot checker. I can tell you personally, it's probably saved me from at least two, two or three accidents. Uh, but the park assist and everything else that's contributed to it, and it's only going to get better. Uh, piece of advice that I would give is I would not buy a car uh, today. I would probably do like a two-year lease because your car becomes outdated in today's world very quickly. The technology becomes outdated uh, in the cars as well. The other piece of advice I would give is that if you are planning to gift your child or your grandchild a car, I would go and spend it on a vacation uh, for yourselves <laughs> uh, instead, because or invest, of course, uh, because I think that I think that a lot of a lot of the younger generation has zero interest in car ownership, uh, and will be will be adopting the shared uh, um, or the uh, or uh, the self driving uh, the Ubers of the world. I can tell you, for me personally, um, I've basically stopped driving to work every day, and I Uber uh, every day because even from a cost perspe perspective in Toronto. Uh, it's become cheaper, and I think you're going to see more and more people. Now, when I go and talk about this with people, I, I often, you know, hear 
the 50 to 65 year old male say there's not a chance I'm ever going to get in one of the back <laughs> seats of those cars. I love driving. Uh, that There's always going to be uh, room for that, uh, for sure. I know a lot of people love driving their cars. I don't know many people that love driving in traffic, but I know a lot of people love driving the open road. I think that it, the first step will be to migrate partially uh, to some of the self-driving experiences and then eventually uh, um, absorb yourself into Does it. Does that mean we can have self-driving Harleys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not yet. But there's, but there's, sorry, one last point. There's, yep. there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues also that still need to get sorted out. Bob and I were talking before about insurance, right? So if you have a self-driving car that gets into an accident and hurts somebody, who gets sued? Um, so there, these are the kinds of things that still need to get sorted out. Is it the owner of the car or is it the manufacturer of the car? Um, th those are all the kind of things that still need to get sorted out. So we're still. Well, who gets uh, a speeding ticket? Who gets, well, I don't think that they'll speed. <laughs> Anyways, th those are the things that they still need to get sorted out. Right? Question over. The, the lithium did, there. Did the everyone only, hear the yeah, question? Yeah. Is there enough lithium in the, the world? The, the question that? is that these are lithium batteries. Uh, the, the lithium isn't the problem, but these batteries need cobalt, and there's uh, 60 or 90, like almost all the cobalt comes from a, like Nigeria and Africa, which is not a stable <clears throat> country. So I'd be more concerned about cobalt. Uh, but uh, the sourcing of these is an issue. Also, too, at the end of lifetime, currently today, there is there is zero recycling capability. So, the, the, and and if you're green conscious, that's a brand new problem that needs to be solved. John, I, I'm aware of a polymer battery technology that can be extremely well with lithium ion, and in every fact, except slightly less dense or any large degree of power. Honestly, you want to look back at a, a Canadian genius, he's from Manitoba, Vaclav Smear, uh, Smeal, uh, and uh, he writes about energy densities, and the ideal fuel is gasoline. Okay, it's got other problems with it, but in terms of energy density, it's it's perfect. Okay, and, and but we're running out of it, and there's a, a lot of issues. All the other. Um, uh, Alternates, uh, hydrogen especially, is not dense. It doesn't transport easily. Uh, uh, the, the electric cars, if everyone's driving electric cars, uh, you need to charge them overnight because the grid infrastructure just isn't there. So there's scaling problems. Um, and uh, But it's clear that the, the, it's the cost is, is a driving factor. And with these dry uh, electrolyte batteries, he can reduce the cost of the batteries significantly. So he, he has a competitive edge with, with lithium dry electro, with the patents for um, Maxwell Technologies. Maxwell yeah. Okay. yeah, Ellen, go ahead. Uh, on Elon Musk, he had announced something about this small black box that we would have in our basement that would fuel our entire house. Have you heard anything more on that? Uh, uh, this is n nothing new. Um, it was the fellow that uh, David Sarnoff ran NBC, uh, oh, it was NBC back in the 1950s. He predicted that we'd all have nuclear reactors in our basement. Um, I, I know that one of the companies that Elon Musk runs uh, is, takes his battery technology, puts them in your home, and allows you to have solar on, on your roof. It stores it when there's no sun right. and allows you to uh, th 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 essentially uh, get mostly off grid. So I think it's that it wasn't a black box. It's, 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 it looks like a, a refrigerator. His solar panels. So he's got solar panel technology and, and a way to store it using his lithium technology. So uh, I'm going to move on to artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on. Um, I'm going to have the computer give the answer. <laughs> 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 Thanks for your question, Bob. You're, you're welcome. Um, anyway, why don't you start us off with that one? Artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and so on. Um, yeah, well, I mentioned at the beginning that I think we're going to have, uh, in the next 10 years, robots living in our home. Uh, we sort of do, if any of you have a Roomba. Uh, but that is the old version of technology in the sense that you know, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't have much, it doesn't have the ability to climb stairs, for example, which requires a certain amount of dexterity. Sorry, a Roomba is the vacuum? Yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> I, I mean, that's probably, I mean, look, it started with the dishwasher. Right. Um, it was probably the first sample of robotics that we had in our home. Um, and now it's kind of graduated. I would even categorize to a degree, you know, our Google Home or Alexa or whatever uh, device you're using, if any of you have them, uh, are another element of robotics in the house. I think that you're going to find that, it, you know, in the next 10 years, you will have a robot helping out in day-to-day um, uh, light housekeeping, maybe even some cooking, uh, but especially in home care uh, as well with reminders for medicines, uh, helping the individual being almost like an alarm uh, set for an individual if they have any ailments and so on. And then continuing even further, and we can, we can, we can go really deep into AI because AI is such a fascinating um, area, but you know, for example, Amazon with Alexa uh, is going to get heavily entrenched into the healthcare industry. Uh, where, for example, if you have some kind of an ailment, let's say you have like five different sim- symptoms, you can actually talk to Alexa and, and ask uh, for advice instead of actually going to the doctor. Uh, and Alexa will diagnose you, and Amazon will deliver whatever medicine uh, is required to help you. Uh, with a cure. I know that sounds kind of far-fetched, but by the way, that's probably only about a year and a half, two years uh, from now. And what you're going to find is it's going to decrease uh, significantly the amount of wait times in the eMERGE rooms uh, uh, as well. You're going to have robots performing surgery. That's already happening. Uh, Fanuc is a really big uh, surgical robotics organization uh, that is helping a lot with doctors. Right now, everything, just like the self-driving car, is human-assisted um, with, for example, robotics. But eventually, we will have autonomous robotics actually taking on surgery. And think about how great that will be, because I'm sure everyone in this room has had to wait anywhere from weeks to a year uh, for a specific procedure. Now that we introduce robotics into surgery, uh, the wait time will be decreased by about 80 to 90%. So those are some of the ways that I think robotics are going to change. Artificial intelligence is going to change uh, the way we live. I think anytime anybody reads an article about AI, they, it always talks about the amount of jobs that are going to be lost uh, from artificial intelligence. You will see a number of the redundant uh, jobs lost, but more focused on the narrower uh, uh, side of production or manufacturing. Uh, it's going to be a long time before AI replaces a lot of the jobs that require broad skills. That would be my view. I have a quick question, not to be a downer, but I really believe in AI and robotics. But you're talking about cybersecurity. I just saw a TV program where a hacker took control of a guy's car mm-hmm. while he was driving. And how they're taking the, the robots or the, the AI we have in your homes right now, and hackers can go in and do things to your house. So, I think it's it's less about AI and it's more about cybersecurity. I mean, I think Bob would probably agree. But you're you're absolutely right. I mean, it is it, there are uh, as it relates to cybersecurity. If you go and talk to two experts, um, one person will say that they're huge believers in the role of AI related to cybersecurity. And then you will talk to another person, they'll they'll say that at the current moment, they do not believe that AI is that advantageous within cybersecurity to help protect. But you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a major issue for self-driving cars, right? If you, if again, we don't want to be too negative, but if you had a hacker that works for a terrorist cell that actually wants to hack into the automobiles, um, or a 747 servers. aircraft. Or seven, I mean, what a lot of people don't know, speaking of, is, the, is, 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 is yeah, I know, that's kind of, yeah. but what, what a lot of people don't know is that most of your, most of your flight uh, that you take on a plane today is autonomous. Yeah. Uh, about 80 to 90% of the functionality of planes today is autonomous. There's your very, gone up, like the accident rate has gone down. Yeah, right? yeah. Thanks for bringing it positive again. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. But yeah, most of it, most of it is uh, autonomous today. But you can... I, I, I'm not going to take a positive or a negative attitude. Think of the AI as your kitchen knives. You can use those kitchen knives to make gourmet meals, or you can use them uh, in a dis- destruction, destructive, male- malevolent fashion. It's, it's in the hands of the user. And the AI is, is, is actually a neutral technology, but it's the people who are uh, directing it and, and making the applications for good or for bad. Okay, this is the, that's, that, that's how you can look at it. Uh, I, I'll give you a good 
application. Uh, actually, if you're talking to Alexa, Siri, Cortana, that's natural language understanding, okay? Uh, and you can say, Alexa, uh, I, uh, how, what should I do with my funds in the TD Bank? And uh, the, the Dow Joe went down 200 uh, points, and, and what are the buying opportunities? And Alexa will uh, presumably have a, uh, uh, an engine that will be able to make uh, investment recommendations without involving uh, people and time. And you'll get that answer. You can snap your fingers as back in 10 seconds because your timing may be uh, important. Uh, one of the applications that r really caught my attention is a company in the States called, not analytics, but analytics. And what they've done is they've looked at about 17,000 uh, chest x-rays from people. And uh, they, each of the chest x-rays were, were, uh, were annotated by uh, 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 radiologists and oncologists. And these people had shadows in their lungs. And a shadow in your lung can either be um, an, uh, something that's uh, benign, which is a, a, an OK thing, or it could be mal malignant. And if you, you got to get the diagnosis right. Because if uh, the doctor diagnoses that shadow as being benign and it's really malignant, six months from now, you're not going to be here. So you, you can't, it, it's that, that important. Uh, they went through a deep learning system. The deep learning system had all the annotations. It looked at all the x-rays. And it started, uh, you now gave, you trained the system. You started giving it new x-rays. Statistically uh, speaking, the, di the correct diagnosis rate of analytics is better and superior to a radiologist. So today, uh, if you have a chest x-ray, um, uh, I would certainly get a second opinion, and it would be from a computer and not a doctor. That's today. So I have a couple more questions here. And one of them is, well, they're both really good. So when can we expect to see 3D printer food products in our home? <laughs> I know what he's going to say. I've done enough of these uh, discussions. He thinks you're gonna. He thinks you're gonna move into gonna a 3D two, home. I'm gonna give you two wild right? answers. You're gonna okay? talk about the house. Uh, I'll talk whatever you want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, for, forget about food, okay? Um, we can print uh, human organs today. Uh, what? Absolutely. Uh, there are tri trials. To, here, here's how it works. You uh, actually 3D print yourself um, a, a scaffold, mostly of cellulose. So it gives you the structure of, of the part. So a kidney, uh, for example. Uh, kidneys are hard because they've got lots of fine parts, but we can print them fine enough. Hearts are the best to do. So you print yourself a heart. Suppose you need a new heart, a transplant, OK? Typically, uh, you have to wait for somebody to die. Uh, and uh, uh, many people die waiting for transplants. And number two, the heart you get is going to be too big, too small or, or it's going to have a lot of miles on it anyways. So what you do is you get yourself an MRI of your heart, you build a 3D printed image of the structure of your heart, and you fix up any problems with the heart from a mechanical standpoint. You make the cellulose structure, uh, and then you have to donate some stem cells, okay? The stem cells are multiplied. As soon as they're around the structure, they start differentiating themselves, and in two days it starts beating. In, in four weeks, you have a, a heart that's viable. And today, uh, that is happening in 3D printing for small animals. OK. Wow. Uh, for food, uh, Bill Gates believes that uh, lab laboratory grown meat is the answer. We don't have to kill cows anymore, but it, it doesn't taste so good. And it's six hundred dollars for a hundred grams, so that we're we're we're, we're not the there we're yet. yet. Okay, but if you think about it, from a greenhouse gas emission, about thirty percent of uh, methane is produced by the beef industry, and we all eat beef. Uh, and so that, from a long-term standpoint, um, is is this is long off, okay? But I think that's that's something that we uh, need to be cognizant. Three D printing is is really big in aerospace. That's yes. the the home run. But why don't you explain? Maybe because there's probably people here that don't really know what 3D printing the, is. The, the, the idea here, we have uh, printers at our home we can print on paper. That's two-dimensional. So we basically put ink on a piece of paper. Uh, think of a box where you can actually uh, produce some kind of three-dimensional object, a toy or a tool or a part, uh, and, uh, and you can actually ex have a, a device that's got composition X, Y, and extru extru extrudes the material you need. Uh, and, and you can buy 3D printers for your home for about 700 bucks, but they extrude things like plastics and people. That, that really uh, didn't catch on. That was the, the hope that we'd have them all in our homes. But the real winning winner is, is, in, is in healthcare. Well, I'm moving on. You can make uh, hearts. Uh, you can make bone grafts and uh, eventually kidneys. But the, but the other home run today is making parts out of for aerospace. If you think about uh, Boeing, they don't make hundreds of airplanes. They make dozens of them. And they can reduce 30% of the weight uh, of it. And 
And parts that originally had 15 or 20 different parts can be a single part, so they're more reliable. They reduce 30% of the weight, uh, so they're, and, and so they're more reliable, less money, uh, and and uh, it's it's clearly a home run. And also, too, they can make arbitrarily complex shapes, which means they can have more efficient fuel injection, so they get uh, more uh, miles from the same amount of uh, jet fuel. So it's, it's, it's a big, big win. The growth market, about 20 to 25 percent uh, every year in uh, 3D printing, mostly for aerospace and industrial applications. But healthcare is going to, uh, I predict in five to 10 years from now uh, that there, you won't have to wait for a donor for a heart transplant, especially if somebody in China uh, breaks all the ethics rules and, and, and prints a heart and then uh, uh, puts them to people. We've got the, the CRISPR twins that uh, basically the uh, science was advanced, but uh, it had no regard for, 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 for ethics. But we can print uh, body organs uh, and, and get replacement parts for the first time in our, our that's pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> okay, that was out Anyone there. need a heart? <laughs> <laughs> so I have one last question here. If there's anything else, we'll, we'll uh, maybe wrap it up after this one. So it says, hearing about all the potential advancements in technology, I'm wondering what your thoughts are regarding 5G networks and the security challenges for networks versus individuals. Well, you're looking at Let's me. start with 5G. But I can start with 5G. You can, you can talk about the cyber. So 5G is going to, 5G stands for the fifth generation. Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, some countries are still in 3G, but most of us are in 4G. Uh, 5G is really going to be probably about six times faster uh, than uh, where we are right now at 4G. And what that means is uh, it's really going to help in many, many areas. Uh, going back to, for example, uh, future of the automobile uh, and autonomous cars, it's the, the faster uh, speed that we have uh, is going to help with decreased latency. Latency means, you know, when you when you go on a website, there's that time to load up that website. That's latency, uh, and that's going to be non-existent uh, going forward. So the 5G uh, growth is going to impact so many different areas of technology. I kind of look at it a little bit like AI because AI kind of impacts. You know, future of the automobile, it impacts robotics, it impacts cybersecurity. Same with 5G is just basically a broadband speed that's going to be much faster than what we have right now. So it's going to have an impact in every single area uh, of, of technology. So I think it's going to be a pretty, it's going to be critical for those self-driving cars. It's going to be critical uh, for many other elements, robotics especially uh, as well, and then for your kids or grandkids that are playing video games, it's going to be super, it's going to be super fun for them <laughs> as well. So do you want to add anything I, to I it? Can add, I can add one or two thoughts. Yeah, please, time, time, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 5G does everything 4G does, So it, 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 and, and it does a little bit faster. That's the simple explanation. But it does two things differently. Uh, with the 4G systems, uh, you've got uh, a cell phone tower uh, once every, oh, I know, 800 meters or a kilometer in an urban area. For the 5G systems, you're going to have to put a lot of them on telephone poles. You've got lots more of the cell phone towers, OK? And they'll be tiny little boxes. Having lots more increases the density, number of users users per user area, order of magnitude. You have lots and lots and lots more users. Having the signals go a shorter distance means you get interactive response. You can have virtual reality. Cars can talk to one another uh, to allow a safer drive. And, and that's that's a, uh, the, the, a big plus. The other big plus is it not only speaks faster in terms of having the no delay and the higher bandwidth, it speaks slowly. Uh, you're going to see a huge proliferation proliferation of Internet of Things devices, little devices that control lights, thermostats, escalators, elevators, crosswalks, um, uh, a myriad of devices. Uh, uh, in, in California, they're putting seismic centers, uh, sensors all around California because if they got a 10-minute uh, prediction of an air, uh, earthquake, they can uh, get people in hospitals to a safe place and lives will be saved. And so the Internet of Things speaks once, uh, just, just a packet, once every six seconds, 10 seconds, a minute, it's perf it accommodates the Internet of Things, which really could evolve to billions of devices. Now, the political question is, Huawei is the real leader in this space. Okay, uh, not Cisco, not Juniper, not uh, Ericsson, not Siemens. And last I checked, the uh, chief financial officer of Huawei is at house arrest in Vancouver. 
and uh, uh, Huawei, there's a, essentially an embargo of Huawei equipment into the United States. Um, and it's a conundrum because they're a leader. I understand that Rogers tell us- So you think the two are correlated? Well, it, it, <laughs> Conspiracy um, theorists? I, I have a politically correct <laughs> expression, but I'll, I'll tell you after. Um, okay. it, 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 I, I, I'm a believer in X-Files, okay, so that, that happened. Uh, but um, uh, they're, they're the country mile leader in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think Justin Trudeau does whatever Donald Trump tells him to do, so this is maybe, maybe the issue here. But that, that equipment is, is, is uh, a po politically um, a non-starter for any kind of U.S. government. And uh, the U.S. government is pressuring uh, NATO allies uh, to uh, sing the same song, and and uh, it would appear that uh, the the liberals are are singing Donald Trump's song at the moment. I just want to add one more thing about five uh, G because I think it's 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 uh, relevant. So we're finally now getting to the point where telco companies, <laughs> telecommunication companies, actually have more customers in the world uh, than electric companies do. So more and more people are getting plugged in. It's 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 quite an alarming number for a lot of people because we tend to in Canada we tend to sometimes live in a bit of a bubble. But ten years ago, only twenty percent of the of the world's population actually had internet access. Today, uh, fifty percent actually have it. Still small uh, on a relative basis. But with the five G networks, it's going to be able to actually increase the ability uh, to get online, and we'll start to move probably in the next five years to about eighty percent. Uh, access. More people will be carrying around their phones. Uh, nobody's going to have landlines uh, anymore. And that improved speed is going to be super. <laughs> Somebody has a landline here. That's okay. Uh, it's imp <laughs> <laughs> the improved speed okay. The improved speed is going to change so many elements of our life. Sir, you have a question. Yes, I have heard that I should be concerned about a robotic house and all these things that listen and reorder mm. and monitor my lifestyle because not only will they take care of me, they will pass on the information to Huawei, <laughs> and the Chinese government will know what I'm doing. How, how much fantasy is that? Or Are you hiding anything? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have this debate with people all the time about about data. I mean, data is the new gold or oil, and much of the world's data has been created just in the last five years. Like 90% of the world's data has been created in the last five years, and it's doubling every two years because we are so connected. He mentioned the Internet of Things. Think about that number, right? Right now we have about 30 billion devices connected. That's what, five per person on the planet? Um, it's, it's obviously many of us have 15 or 20 uh, devices. So we are, the, the biggest challenge that we've got with data is, uh, is it's not necessarily being policed properly. So in Europe, they have something called uh, GDPR, which is actually policing the amount of data and governing the privacy of individuals in terms of the information flow uh, that's, that's going to, to those companies. Um, in Canada, we're starting to actually adopt those types of rules as well, which governs the kind of data that's going. You know, is Alexa or Google Home listening before I, I signal? There's been incidences where there has been some listening taking place. They'll claim that it was a malfunction uh, within the speaker. My view has been always with this type of technology that the increased efficiencies and productivity that it creates for my life is worth the, uh, the, the loss of a certain amount of privacy that I might actually have. So, uh, you know, Google knows what restaurant I just went to. Um, they know what hotel I just stayed at. Um, I got a Fitbit that knows exactly what my heart rate is and the fact that I didn't work out for the last three days in a row, all that kind of stuff, right? There's a lot of data about me uh, that exists out there. But I've gotten over that, and I feel like, you know, the increased productivity that it enables me to have in my life is... is yes. The, yeah. I, I, I believe the Alexa uh, is an honorable... Actually, going to put profit uh, for Jeff Bezos because uh, it's going to uh, co correlate uh, your thoughts and ideas, what music you like, uh, where you want to go, to suggesting products for you to buy. So it, it, it basically uh, is doing data mining uh, and for 
for, and, and, and I'm guilty of this too. I, I buy certain DVDs, film noir, and when new one comes, comes out, uh, I press the buy button that uh, the artificial intelligence. Sir, did uh, you say you buy the, DVDs? I buy DVDs still. Okay. That, and that works <laughs> not. The Blu ray DVDs. I, I can't get it. Columbia that, House? But, 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 if you, but, if you, but if you take but if you take apart the um, uh, app, the Amazon Alexa device, it has five microphones in there. It can hear a whisper across the room. Okay, it's it's it, if I wanted to make a surveillance device, this thing is 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 world class. Okay, you don't need Russian spy technology or anything. Uh, the, the the question is, so, suppose so, so, some bad character <clears throat> hacks your. Uh, uh, Amazon device, okay? So anything that you say in your bedroom uh, will be recorded by some somewhere else. Today, if uh, uh, if you have, uh, want to have, uh, uh, today, the word they use now is hook up, okay? They, uh, uh, today, if you want to hook up, you can uh, go on Tinder and you can swipe left or right. You can find somebody to hook up with. Uh, you get your Uber to take you to uh, the, uh, the, the hotel room and uh, that's all geotagged with your GPS. So they know uh, <laughs> when you're picked up, where you went, how long you stayed, and, and where you came to. And, and if you're coming from your home to your, your, your uh, the, the moonlight uh, uh, rendezvous, uh, uh, man, you're in trouble if it comes to divorce court. Okay. <laughs> don't, okay let Bob, so don't let Bob finish on that note. I, I'm not letting him finish on that note. <laughs> but but fas fascinating as that is, um, which it has been, w what I found out today was, was a few interesting things. First of all, it is so easy to go down a rabbit hole and look for information, <laughs> and there is a massive amount. You could spend the rest of your life on any one of these subjects and only scratch the surface of what's there. So the benefit of having experts like the two of them in front of us here today and some of the products that are out there, you don't have to have that expertise uh, yourself. You can, it's now incredibly cost effective to have it this way, and you can be diversified in a, in a, a very um, properly diversified way at a low cost. That's a benefit. Second of all, there are things happening today we have no clue about what the future might be. We heard a couple of different opinions here on a couple of different things. The fact is that it's moving far beyond our ability to uh, understand what's going on. Some of it creates anxiety. Some of it creates um, amazing opportunities. And I'm just thinking I'm on the healthcare side alone. <clears throat> Could change dramatically. You know, today, as it sits today in the province of Saskatchewan, 41 cents of every tax dollar goes to pay for our healthcare system in this province. Just think, if that number actually began to uh, come down, where else those resources might be put towards. So there's an exciting part to that. I guess the other piece uh, with regards to automobiles and artificial intelligence and so on, yes, there are scary things that are there, but I think some of the benefits uh, are remarkable and we just sort of take them for granted. They're happening, uh, it's moving forward, the world's a better place than it has was at any time in human history is right now. Less war, longer disease, healthier people, uh, infancy deaths, all the, those are all at all-time lows. So lots of this is very upsetting and scary. The reality is uh, uh, human beings are pretty uh, inventive and ingenious, and there's lots of positives that, that's coming out of it. So on that note, I would like to thank you all for being here today. I thought this was a terrific discussion, so thank you, gentlemen. Really thank you. appreciate it.